there's a lot of work in the open source community on, on these things. And there's a lot of good work. The complication is, is that you don't need one product. You need to pick out the eight or ten pieces that all fit together to do what you need it to do. And um, um, I can't even quote all of the obscure names that you're going to use, but there's going to be a bunch of them. And there's, the, the benefit is there's minimal upfront licensing cost. Um, you have minimal support, minimal documentation. So you end up spending a lot of time and effort to implement and deploy. There's also commercial uh, off-the-shelf products, which potentially have expensive licensed products and have documentation and have support. And then um, you take lots of times to lots of time to an effort to implement and deploy. But one of the things to keep an eye on is that the commercial products are beginning to integrate the open source products. So you have the Oracle Hadoop implementation and the Microsoft Hadoop implementation and then um, IBM Hadoop implementation and so on. So what I've been trying to do is to paint a sort of high-level picture that maybe will help some of the other things that we've been talking about um, fit together. In a lot of ways, big data is what we've, what we've always been doing, um, but the focus is more on the analysis rather than the traditional transaction processing, more on um, predicting things rather than on uh, accounting type things. There are software and techniques for horizontal distribution, which um, adds some level of complexities, We've got lots of new buzzwords. No new technology is any good if it doesn't introduce new buzzwords. The, the real complication is distributing the process and, and integrating the results. <coughs> and the fun thing, I think, is when you're trying to integrate the, data, the, the results from multiple data sources. And that's where I think uh, a lot of the work is going to be in the next um, however many years. But the thing to remember is that big data actually is a tool. The ultimate goal is to produce information that can be used to, to make decisions, to, to make the world better, um, to end world hunger, and, and, and all of those issues. Any questions? Keith. Thanks a lot. So, a lot of topics have been addressed, a lot of things have been mentioned, and I'm sure there are some questions. So, <coughs> oh yeah, thank you. So the microphone is available, <coughs> out of the paper bag. <laughs> okay. In the meantime, uh, now when Geo World and Database World uh, come together, <coughs> it's, uh, thank you, it's kind of a, a paradigm clash because we are coming with different tasks and we have different ideas. And one thing that is being discussed in uh, OGC world and otherwise is uh, query languages, APIs, and how does that work out and what should we use. Uh, the good thing about languages is that we have so many of them. Uh, so from a database perspective, is there some kind of advice you could give to us? Things are going to change. From, from a database perspective, um, a lot of the work in SQL and SQL databases has been in and around um, transaction semantics. The ability to do multiple <coughs> updates and say either commit, roll them back, and have those transactions be consistent. Um, and there's capabilities that have been added to SQL. Anybody could design a, a, a query language as good as SQL if they took 30 years and had a couple hundred people working on it. <coughs> The, the thing about APIs is that you can build an API to do specific tasks and um, document things and make it searchable. The thing about a more general purpose query language is that um, you can build it so people can do things that you didn't think to build an API for. And so I'm a query language kind of guy, and so I sort of come down on, on that. But you need things like uh, JDC. API interface to talk to things or um, to, to get at things. The, the question is, what's the most generalized mechanism that
that makes the data available to whoever needs it. And I think there's always going to be a toss-up between a specific API for a specific problem domain and a generalized query language um, that, um, that, that can be implemented on top of all the different types of data sources. <coughs> Did I walk that line <clears throat> straight enough? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So, um, and yes, Chuck. So I'd like to go back to some of the work you've been doing on SQL. Uh, one thing we have been doing is integrating uh, the general app. Uh, the, there it is. Uh, the, the general idea of a feature with the links asso the associations between the feature, which means we're talking about link data as well as a traditional SQL type feature coding. So how far along have you all gotten integrating with link data queries with the uh, traditional SQL? The, the thing that we've specifically looked at with link data type stuff is um, uh, things like Sparkle mm -hmm. and graph query languages. And <clears throat> within, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> with, within the, uh, the SQL Standards Committee, we, we know how to transform relational data into graph data, which would be sort of like link data. Um, the problem comes with transforming, at least in um, uh, the graph data, the graph representations we look at, the problem comes with transforming that back into um, relations and tables because there are the possibility of cycles. So we can, we can uh, actually 10 years ago, we laid out some mechanisms where we could basically programmatically transform um, data into, into graphs. Uh, the problem is, is that none of the participants in the standards process have convinced their companies that it was something that was worth spending time on, uh, at least within the standards committee. So we've looked at it. <clears throat> we haven't done any real work. So let me give you a use case. <clears throat> So consider a case where I have a relational database, a spatial relational database. So I need the uh, SQL with the multimedia extensions. Uh, I also have a triple store, which is where I store my graph data. The triple store has the associations between the objects in the database. So I want to use GeoSparkle against the triple store. I want to use OGC filter against relational database. I want to hide that all behind a single portal, single API, using a single query language. Okay. Can I do that? <laughs> I'm a database consultant. I'll give you my card. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I could lay out approximately what you would need to do to transform the, um, uh, the, the tabular data mm -hmm. into um, uh, Sparkle. Triples, whatever triple scores, um, and so from that standpoint, yeah, probably is possible. Whether or not it's going to perform well is a different issue. Uh, but performance is a simple matter of hardware and programming. <laughs> and I have friends who are developers who um, make funny faces at me when I say things like that. So, in theory, it should be possible to go that direction. Going. Um, Transforming the, um, the the triple data back into relational data is um, a, a tough problem, I think. It's not so much transforming between them, but being able to have two different types of data with the same query. Right. I think the way you would have to do that is essentially have um, a logical view that, that does the transformer. And okay. uh, we are running into the paid part of the consultancy. So actually, my question was, is it uh, QL I'm sorry. Or I appreciate, I appreciate that we are going into these discussions. Uh, maybe that's a good thing for the break. Uh, thanks a lot, Keith. And I'm glad uh, that we find that interest because I like this cross-fertilization between the domains. And it's time to go over to the next speaker. So Glenn, can I ask you on stage, please? Glenn Gümbel is from US Geological Survey. And the screen is working, yes. 
and he is giving us an agency viewpoint on big data and the national map. And I'm giving him a microphone. The floor is oh. yours, Glenn. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. I'll stick it in this uh, sophisticated box here. We're trying to get the uh, go to meeting to show up. Uh, well, while that's going on, the good news is I'm, I was able to come to the TC meeting this week. Uh, the bad news was my colleagues could not, but they handed me the stack of slides. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to give it a I'm going to give it a try here. You screw it all up. I am. I am not certified for this. <clears throat> well, let's get started. I'm Glenn Gimple from USGS. I work in the National Geospatial Program Office. Um, that's the uh, the home of the National Map, which is the U.S. topographic data. Uh, it's a seamless, um, authoritative uh, set of data across the U.S. Um, Within this organization, within our uh, National Geospatial Program, we also have a Center of Excellence for Geospatial Information Science. It's our research group. Um, and the director who, who was supposed to come and do this uh, couldn't make it this week, and he apologizes for that. But um, they're doing some work with, with uh, how to deal with some of the big data that we deal with. So, um, what do we consider big data? And I like that description this morning about it's really, you know, your big data depends on you and what you have to deal with. And so we've got um, our national map uh, products that are up on the web. They're, they're uh, staged products, and that accounts for about uh, 27 uh, terabytes of data. It just keeps piling it up <coughs> more and more every year. Um, there's also, uh, and Landsat is not, a, national map product, but I included this because, first of all, the size, they've got 2.8 petabytes of data, but it continually grows and grows, and scene after scene after scene just keeps piling on. Uh, but they provided me some information about what they're doing, uh, which I'll get to in a minute, uh, that I thought I'd, I'd like to share with you guys. Um, the other piece is our LiDAR point cloud data, and this sucker is brand new for us. We've been doing this for just over a year in our new program. Um, so we're, we're talking uh, 75 terabytes alone already, and we're expecting to get uh, you know, up to, what, seven petabytes within uh, potentially eight years, um, maybe sooner. So I mentioned the, the Lanza, and, and I'm not the expert on this. I am just, just wanted to share this with you, but I thought this was, was pretty interesting because they're, they're taking those those scenes that they've collected, you know, over I don't know how many years, um, and they're producing a uh, like a, um, a data cube of this information, which will enable you to start diving into um, the information and pulling out some kind of um, analytics from it. So I, I left the how do you get in contact with them if you're interested in learning more? Uh, so. I'm here to really talk about the LiDAR data, because that is really our, our big data. So, you know, where are we now? Where do we want to be? <clears throat> What's our plans in the near future and, and coming up in fiscal year 17 is coming around the corner? And where our, reach of, our research is out of our uh, center of excellence. So, um, <clears throat> who likes baby pictures? Because this is, this is our new baby. <laughs> this is actually a one-year-old. So it's not quite an infant anymore, but um, this uh, is the future for us. I mean, we're, we're really spending a lot of time and energy and um, high level uh, visibility on this project. So just want to talk a little bit about it uh, because I thought this project uh, within the federal government was done correctly, where they took their time to do this national enhanced elevation assessment study where they went out to federal government um, components, they went to states, they went to other organizations and they said, we're planning on doing this. We're going we're gonna to collect this point cloud data, this 3D data. What does it mean to you and what, you know, what kinds of requirements do you have? And 
they collected a ton of information. Really, that's an interesting read if you're curious about 3D data. Um, and they found a sweet spot where it was, we can do this, it's beneficial, we can, it's cost effective, uh, we meet a lot of needs. And that's sort of where we started uh, in justifying a, a program to collect this data across the United States. Uh, here's a quick example of, this is, <laughs> this is really bad, this is our 10 meter uh, one third arc second product that we've been producing for many years and then this is what uh, will be produced and is being produced now in our digital elevation model. So incredible accuracy, I should say accuracy, incredible, incredible detail. Um, so this is some of the areas that we're, this data is being used for. Uh, we've, uh, it's amazing when you read that, that study, uh, who can really benefit from this? It's, it's, it's really interesting because you find stuff that you didn't even think about, like the alternative energy with you know, the rooftops where to put solar panels. Uh, 